This is draft season, and it is just about draft day. We're recording this on Wednesday morning, so odds are you're listening to this either the day before the draft or the day of the draft. I'm John Schmelk, joined by my duo of Tony Pauline and Eric Crocker. This podcast is presented by Tommy Hilfiger, a PVH brand, and an official partner of the New York Giants. Tony is at home. He still has his VHS t- players above his left shoulder. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about Tony. Are those actually VHS players? Is that what that yeah. is? They are. They are. You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit easy. You know, I, I had them here for ages. So, you know, yeah, you got DVR and you can download the film as I usually do. Uh, but sometimes that takes a little bit of time. So in the interim, if you just, you know, tape the games and see what happens uh, until you can get the official uh, all 22 film. I love it. I love it. Um, by the school, way, you, you can if you sell way. those on eBay. You can make a pretty penny on those things. People are looking for VHS players now for their old tapes. So just FYI. Uh, I'll All take right. into consideration when I move. Thanks, bro. Yes, <laughs> no problem. And uh, Eric Crocker is on location in Dallas. He's going to be doing a lot of draft coverage for Locked On NFL Draft uh, this weekend. Croc, want to tell the folks everything you're doing? Yeah, I'm out here. Uh, we'll be at the Tegna Studios here in Dallas, and we'll be covering the draft live. So I believe it's on the Locked On Network YouTube channel. It might nice. be on the Locked On NFL Draft YouTube channel as well, and whatever other local station <laughs> they have covering it. But uh, that's cool. First time ever, you know, doing something like this, I had to be a lot more prepared, knowing at least a little bit on most of these prospects that begin their name called this weekend. Yeah, absolutely. And folks, of course, we'll be live here uh, doing reactions to picks on the Giants YouTube channel, Giants.com. And we'll have our rapid reaction to the first round of the draft hitting on Friday morning. We'll react to the entire draft. That episode will post on Sunday. And of course, check out Big Blue Kickoff Live. Uh, we're live uh, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, uh, 12 to 2. Uh, on Thursday and Friday, and then on Saturday, we're 11 to 1. We'll have reactions after each one of the Giants picks for the Giant fans out there listening. Uh, so make sure you go <laughs> check that out. All right, guys, let's get to it. This is our final mock draft. We've assigned each person a set of teams. We've mixed it up from what we did last time. So we have different guys doing different teams. We need Tony a chance to kind of chime in with uh, who he thinks these teams uh, will be picking in terms of uh, rumors he's hearing around the league. And let's start here with the Jaguars. And I, I have the the joy of picking the first player here. And I wish it was a normal year because it would be easy. This is not easy uh, because right now, based on reporting by Tony, based on reporting by Daniel Jeremiah, the head coach, Doug Peterson, wants Ikema Kwanu. The head coach, uh, rather the general manager, Trent Balky, wants Trayvon Walker. And Tony, you reported that the owner is now involved and he wants Aiden Hutchinson, right? So I don't think Trent Balky wins that tug of war. I think in normal times, the owner, especially you know, down there, you know, he seems to have taken more of a hands-on approach, especially after the Urban Meyer disaster. But I think you bring in a Super Bowl winning coach like Doug Peterson, you have a quarterback like Trevor Lawrence. And I realize they just signed Cam Robinson to that three-year contract. I don't care. I think in the end, you do what's best for the quarterback. You trust your head coach. You just brought in to run your offense. You give him what he wants. So I'm going to go Iki Aquano here with the first overall pick to the Jacksonville Jaguars, kind of circling back, Tony, to where we were when we talked in Indy, talking about a tackle going number one instead of a pass rusher. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the pass rusher may be the best best players in the draft. So are they going with need? Are they going with the best player available? Or are they going on the whim of their brand new head coach? First thing is, is you know, why is the owner having a say? I mean, the uh, you know, Con, good for him. Uh, he's not out there scouting. So I, I you know he's partial to Aiden Hutchinson, but you got to wonder about that. And you're right. I mean, Balky can't pound the table for Trayvon Walker as much as he wants him because if Trayvon Walker doesn't pan out quickly and things go south, guess who's getting thrown under the bus? Go with the Quanu. You mentioned Cam Robinson. They signed him to the extension. You put a Quanu at right tackle. And the, the, the thing about the Quanu, if he goes one, it really sets the tone for those first three or four picks because there were two other teams, the Texans and the Jets, who also want a Quanu. Yeah, and I think I just made this easier for you, Mr. Crocker, at number two with the Detroit Lions. Yeah, got them taking Aiden Hutchinson. And, and he gets to stay up in that area in, in the state of Michigan. Hutchinson, for a guy like Dan Campbell, it feels like he just fits that. It's almost like Campbell's going to take him under his wing and they're going to ride this thing out together and try to turn this organization around. All right, Tony. And I think the Lions, basically, it gets dictated, right? It, it, from what you're hearing, it's either Hutchinson or Walker in that order, whichever which guy's on the board. I mean, that makes sense. I mean, it's, it's always been whatever player the Jacksonville Jaguars selected, 
the uh, st- the Lions would take the other one. So if the Lions took Trayvon Walker, uh, if the uh, uh, Jaguars took Trayvon Walker, the Lions would take Hutchinson. If the Jaguars took Hutchinson, the Lions would take Trayvon Walker. Now it seems to be leaning towards Hutchinson, even if they have their uh, choice of both players. All right, let's go to you, Tony, at number three, the Houston Texans. I gave you the tough one. This is the wild card. Yeah. I, I could throw four or five names out there. It wouldn't surprise me. What are you hearing? Quano's off the board. I think right now, I know right now, the debate is going to be between Trayvon Walker and Derek Stingley, who we spoke about the last show moving up draft boards. I'm told that Coach Levy Smith is really leaning towards Derek Stingley. It may end up being uh, Trayvon Walker, but I'm going to go with Derek Stingley, the big physical corner who, you know, he's got great upside. You could potentially be getting an all-pro cornerback for your franchise for the next 10 years if you're able to keep him, or you're going to get a guy that's injured, that's inconsistent. A lot of risk here, but a lot of reward if you, if you hit on him. You know, Croc, we talked about fit with cornerbacks in the Texans. So I went back and using PFF, I looked up what kind of coverages the Texans ran last year. Remember, Lovey Smith was, was their DC, right? So I think it's a pretty good idea of how they want to use these guys. And they actually ran cover one more than 30% of the time. And then cover three and cover two was down around 21, 22%. So I think maybe, and I'm as much to blame for this anyway, because I brought it up on the last show, but then I went and double-checked my work, that maybe this whole idea that Lovey Smith stole this old-school cover two guy they're playing a lot more man than they were before. So Stingley makes a lot of sense here since he can do both. Yeah. And if you can just sprinkle in some of the other coverages, I always tell people I can teach zone eyes. I can teach you how to play zone. I can teach you how to anticipate zone coverage and read those concepts, but it's hard to teach a guy to play man. You either have those man coverage skills or you don't. And clearly Derek Stingley, when he's dialed in his man cover skills are at the top of this class. All right, I have um, taken on the Jets here, and I think this is interesting because I think, based on everything I've been hearing and and people that I trust, I think they love Sauce Gardner. I, I really think they do. But with Trayvon Walker sitting there and Joe Douglas liking big people and Robert Sala coming from a system in San Francisco where they just stockpiled big pass rushers. You know, Nick Bosa was a big dude, 280 pounds, right? DeForest Buckner, big dude. Like, these are big guys. I have a hard time thinking that if Trayvon Walker is there, that they are going to pass on him to pick a cornerback. So I'm going to go Trayvon Walker here to the New York Jets at number four. But I think Sauce Gardner's definitely in the mix here. Tony, what are you hearing about what the Jets are thinking? I I mean, the fact is this is the Jets have to solve the pass rush problem. The pass rush problem for the Jets has been 15 years in in, in the making, and they've never really addressed it. They've tried to, but they've not had any success. So I agree with you. I mean, Ahmad Garner has got to be a consideration because the Jets don't have a number one corner. But you've got to address this pass rush problem. And when you look at the upside, you look at the what Trayvon Walker is able to do, especially in a solid type defense. You look at the athleticism, the long arms. I, I think it's I think it's a can't miss. It's a no-brainer. They got to go with Trayvon Walker if he's staring them in the face. Now the Giants are an interesting situation. And and I took the Giants again, given my, my knowledge of the organization. This is one of the repeat teams that that I, I kept uh for myself here. Because, uh, look, they need an offensive tackle, but I think Sauce Gardner is the perfect fit for Wink Martindale. So the question now is, I feel fairly confident. I don't know what what Tony's going to do, but knowing the Panthers, it's either a trade down or an offensive tackle, in my opinion. And I worry if they trade down and I leave Sauce Gardner on the board that I am going to lose him. And I worry about that. But I don't know if a team is going to trade up. But, you know, a team with multiple picks, you know, maybe the Jets want to move up four spots. They got all these day two picks. They want to move up four spots and get Sauce and the, and uh, and uh, K- Trayvon Walker. So I worry about that. I feel okay. I personally feel okay about Neil and Cross. You know, there's a lot of noise out there about the Giants really liking Charles Cross. But I think Sauce Gardner is a good enough player that the Giants will – roll the dice here on the offensive tackle. So I'm going to give the Giants Sauce Gardner the cornerback out of Cincinnati because I think he fits everything Wink Martindale wants to do. I mean, it sounds strategy. You just got to hope that the uh, the, the Panthers take uh, Charles Cross. Uh, and then you're sitting there with, with uh, another offensive tackle that you can plug into on the right side. But uh, I think it's going to be tough for Carolina to uh, pass up. You know, you Giants are probably going to make some moves with some of their veteran uh, uh, cornerback, or at least the kid from Stanford after the draft. Gardner has got the potential to be a number one corner. He's big, he's physical, 
and the day ball and shown had success, you know, drafting first round cornerbacks in Buffalo. So why not take one of the top, some consider or some, as some consider the top cornerback in this year's draft. All right, Tony, let's go to you at the Panthers. Let's see if I made the right call. What are you doing here? I'm taking Charles Cross. There's no doubt about it. I don't think they're taking a quarterback. I do think that they're going to try and trade down. If they are able to trade down, I think it's only going to be a few spots. I think the coach needs a quarterback to win right away, but any quarterback at this spot would be a massive reach. I think at Charles Cross, they get a guy who fills a need. They get one of the better offensive linemen in this year's draft. Some grade Cross as the top offensive lineman in this year's draft. They get a pure left tackle, or they get the guy who's the purest left tackle of all the uh, players, all the offensive linemen at the top of this year's draft. So it checks all the boxes. Granted, who knows who he's going to be protecting, but you know you got your pass protector for a long time to come. All right, I'm going to go with the Giants really quick here, number seven. I think they would, frankly, hope that the Panthers picked Evan Neal. Um, I think with Mike Kafka and Brian Dable and their histories in Kansas City and Buffalo, they want to throw the football, man. Pass protection is their priority. And like you said, Tony, Charles Cross, best feet in the draft. His ability to recover, his balance is fantastic. But uh, at this at this point, it's a very easy pick. I think Kayvon Thibodeau would be in the mix here. Like if Sauce Gardner gets wiped out and, you know, they they decide to pick a um, a uh, offensive tackle at five. I think Thibodeau's in the mix here. I think Jermaine Johnson's in the mix here. If Stingley was there, I think Stingley would be in the mix here. I think the Giants have a lot of options. And frankly, much like the Panthers, Tony, I think the Giants will be looking to, to try to trade down here to get extra picks too. But like you, I'm just not sure any teams will be looking to trade up to do that. So I'm going to go Evan Neal here. Uh, we have not heard, Croc, from you in a couple of picks here. You can make your pick at the Falcons. We can also comment on what just happened in the last three. Yeah, I mean, with the last three, with the offensive linemen going off the board, I think the Atlanta Falcons, they're definitely a team that can improve in that area. You know, Matt Ryan, and obviously he got traded away and that Marcus Mariota, their quarterback now. But watching Matt Ryan last season, I, I just felt bad. He was running for his life. He's getting <laughs> older. I'm like, man, I know this is not what he wants for himself. So he got out of there. The, the, the Falcons are in this really weird situation because they have a lot of glaring holes. And there are teams and fan bases, they think their team has holes. I don't think anyone has as much as Atlanta Falcons. They're they probably roster. one of the bottom it, three rosters roster. in the NFL. Yeah. And there are definitely a lot of different ways we can go here with the Riley, uh, Riley Ridley, with the Calvin Ridley situation, him being suspended for a year. Before him, they were very thin at receiver. And you're like, man, do you want to go receiver here? But also it's a deeper draft class for receivers in the sense of being able to get guys second round that can definitely contribute and um, be productive. So, they need help on defense as well. And I think right here, Kayvon Thibodeau, he feels like he fits Atlanta and fits that kind of that whole area, the, the dynamic and culture of there. A guy that can really kind of rush off the edge for them. And I, I bet they'd probably be happy to get a blue chipper on field like what Thibodeau can bring. So, yeah, I'm going with Thibodeau to the Atlanta Falcons. You know, I mean, Tony, I, I, I've heard conflicting things about what Atlanta thinks of, of Thibodeau. Some people have said they're in on him. Other people have said they're not. I mean, I haven't heard anything specifically about it, but the fact is this. He's one of the better players in this draft. Is there risk there? Yes. The Falcons have holes all over the place. So if you hit on him, I think it's great value with the with this selection. They get it, they get one of the best players in the draft, fills a need. The guy's got a great amount of upside. I mean, every team is going to be half in, half out on Thibodeau. There are some teams that are say no way. At some point in time, the risk of the reward becomes greater than the risk. And I think that's the situation here with Atlanta. Well, I think the Seahawks might be a little annoyed here, Tony. My guess is that they would love to bring in Kayvon Thibodeau too. So what do you think they're thinking here at number nine? Well, here's what I'm going to say. I have the Seahawks taking Trevor Penning for this mock draft, but I don't think the Seahawks are going to be selecting number nine. Mm -hmm. I think the see, I know the Seahawks are looking to trade down. They're looking to trade down and potentially get to trade. The Eagles are potentially looking to trade up and get Jameson, uh, Jameson Williams the receiver Alabama out of Alabama, New Orleans is called about the pick. I have Seattle taking Trevor Penning. I think they will eventually take him in that 14, 15, 16, uh, 15, 16 range with a trade down to either the Philadelphia Eagles or New Orleans Saints. Interesting. You think, I guess my question for you would be, should they feel comfortable going behind the Ravens at 14 that he's still going to be there? Not only the Ravens, but also the Texans. Because yeah. you remember the Texans, if they don't get a pass rusher, based on my, you know, if they don't take a pass rusher, uh, number one, for this purposes, I haven't taken Stingley. 
uh, you know, they could take uh, Trevor Penning. So, I mean, it, it's a gamble, but the fact is this is Seattle needs a lot of help. They want to collect a lot of uh, extra selections, and there are teams like the Eagles that have a lot of draft capital. And you think a team will be moving up for a wide receiver in their spot to try to get ahead of the Jets? I think I think the team will absolutely be moving up ahead of the Jets to ensure themselves of Jamison Williams. I was told that the Saints may be moving up for a quarterback. I can't believe that. I, I think it's got to be for one of the receivers. All right, I got the Jets with their second pick at number 10. I've heard so much noise that they love Drake London. I'm not going to argue with it. I think he's a good compliment to Elijah Moore. Um, I'll pencil him in, give uh, you know Zach Wilson a nice big target out there. I'll go Drake London at number 10 to the Jets. We've kind of had a receiver penciled into the Jets at 10 for a while. I don't think that changes here, despite the fact they have those two picks at the top of the second round. The question right, let's is, go number- the, the, the question, I think the question yeah. is, are the Jets going to make this pick on uh, right. tomorrow night, or is it going to be owned by the San Francisco 49ers, who eventually get this pick from the Jets uh, as part of a trade for Debo Samuel? That's the hot top. That's the big noise in league circles right now. Well, Tony, how about this then? Uh, would the Niners then pick a wide receiver to replace Debo, you think? What, what do you think they would do if they moved up here? They would have to, right? Now, whether it's Drake London, whether it's Jameson Williams, Garrett Wilson, I absolutely think they would take a receiver at 10 uh, as part of the trade up, or as part of the trade for Debo Samuel. Croc, you cover the Niners. What do you think they would do with 10 if, if they do make that trade with Debo? I think they would like to trade back if possible. We've already talked about it. More teams are trying to trade back then trade up. So not sure if that's possible, but what's the value for a guy like Traylon Burks who led the college football, led the nation in yards after catching? That's what the 49ers have predicated a lot of their offense on. Now, it is a little different bringing in Trey Lance and the dynamic of him being able to throw the ball down the field. But even then, Traylon Burks, he fits that as well with his uh, terrific contested catch ability. So I think someone like Traylon Burks, who he's not the sexiest of route runners and things like that, I don't think they're necessarily needing that. They got Brandon Ayuk as well, but having a guy like Burks who can still stretch the field and give you that run after catch ability and a little bit more versatility, I think they'll like that. So, but I don't know if they like him at 10. He didn't quite run fast enough. All right, Tony, let's go to you. The Washington Commanders at 11 here. Uh, a lot of people think they're also in the wide receiver market. I've heard them connected to Chris Olave a lot at this spot. I think it's going to be a, uh, a wide receiver. I don't think it's going to be Chris Olave, although personally I would love it because I think Olave is going to be uh, one, it is one of the most underrated receivers in this year's draft. Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go with receiver and I'm going, to, I'm going to go off of my board. I'm going to take Garrett Wilson, uh, shorthanded receiver, excellent route runner, doesn't have the deep speed of Olave, but is still a vertical uh, wide out who can get down the field, checks a lot of the boxes, and I think it gives uh, the the Washington Commanders immediate impact at that position, which they need. Yeah, I agree. I think he compliments McLaurin well, too. Croc, 12, Minnesota Vikings. They've been connected to Derek Stingley for a long time to get him kind of as that little brother to Patrick Peterson. At this point, I think all of us agree there's very little chance he gets to 12. Uh, what do they do here now? They still go secondary, and I think they take – Best player on their board, and for my money, that's probably Kyle Hamilton. I know Tony's not as high on Kyle Hamilton as the rest of the uh, draft circle. I, I'm not either. The, the, I like Lewisine. That's my safety one yeah. in this class. Yeah. But if you're just talking about a guy who is a playmaker, a guy who get back there, play a couple years with Smith, learn the game from that perspective, uh, he still brings big time ability and flexibility. Even if he kind of they follow Tony Pauline's line of thinking and move him to more of a hybrid slash linebacker type guy who could play around the box a little bit in space, but maybe not as much. But Kyle Hamilton, terrific football player. I think him going in the mid teens is a little more likely than what was talked about initially. And Tony pushed back on this going in the top five. Well, I mean, I don't dislike Kyle Hamilton. I just don't think he's a top, he's top 10 talent because of the things you mentioned, because of the limitations. I do think that uh, if he gets past Washington or as you said, Minnesota, he could slide a long way. So this is the area where I think Kyle Hamilton is probably going to go. Yeah, I've heard actually Harrison Smith comparisons with him, that that's actually not a bad comp for him. So interesting that, that he could get paired with Harrison Smith um, in Minnesota. All right, let's go to the Houston Texans. Tony, you made their first pick. That was Derek Stingley at number three. And now they're up here at number 13. What are you thinking? They, they passed up the pass rusher with their first go round at number three. They still need a pass rusher. I'm going to go with Jermaine Johnson. I mean, a natural fit, a guy who gets a lot of upfield pressure, 
that sort of slightly undersized but explosive fast off the edge pass rusher that the uh, the Texans and, and Lovey Smith like. I think this is a natural fit for the Texans. All right, I think this is great value for him at 13 too. I think this is a nice spot for him in that kind of 8 to 14 area. All right, Baltimore Ravens, Croc, you're up, pal. No offensive lineman left for you, at least a tackle here. Uh, yeah, no offensive tackles, but there is a guard. So sure. we're going with Zion Johnson here Ooh. and get big there in the middle, continue to push guys. You know, they want to move guys around up front. Obviously, they lean heavy on the run game and you want to protect their young quarterback a little bit more as well. So, yeah, we're going to go with Zion Johnson. Hopefully we can keep uh, Lamar Jackson a little healthier. Did you consider Jordan Davis here? That's That was I've the other guy. Jo- Jordan Davis, to me, he exemplifies <laughs> what? Uh, the Baltimore Ravens are, which is just this big, massive team, especially up front, and they want to impose their will and size on people. So it, it was one or the other. I feel like I've just gone with that for the last few months, and I'm like, okay, let's switch it up just a little bit, but still build in the trenches with Zion Johnson. Tony, Jordan, Jordan Davis, I, it, it, I mean, I, I still, yeah, I, I, I think Jordan Davis is potentially the pick, though. Tony, what are you hearing about Baltimore? Yeah, if it's not Trevor Penning, I think it's going to be Jordan Davis. So find the biggest and nastiest guy and basically just plug him in is basically what you're telling me. (laughs) All right, Eagles at 15, Tony. They didn't have to trade up to get their guy. They're sitting pretty at 15. They need speed of wide receiver. Boom, Jamison Williams. Put him in. That's it. I I mean, I I think they'll get him. I don't know if it's going to be a 15. I think they'll have to trade up to get him. But, you know, and this will be the third year in a row that Howie Roseman and the Eagles have selected a receiver in the first round. Uh, Draylon Rager has been a bust. Uh, for, for, by the way, second straight year from Alabama. A right, wide exactly. receiver in the first round. Exactly. The, the, the kid from Alabama last year was good. So hopefully he, he, he turns out he gets another hit from Alabama. So it's, I think this is the player that they want. He likes speed. He likes explosiveness. He being Howie Roseman, bringing those players into the system, into that franchise. It's, it's a natural fit. So are you and Mickey Loomis like slamming your fist on the table here, Croc, that I took your speed wide receiver one pick ahead of the Saints? No. And uh, where I'm going to go in this this uh, direction now is with Kenny Pickett, quarterback out of Pittsburgh. And, Ooh. you know, we've talked a lot about uh, the need for a receiver there. And we've also talked about some of the quarterbacks going much higher than this. But Kenny Pickett, he'll now be the first quarterback off the board. I think he just fits that mold of the Saints having a quarterback who maybe not the biggest arm or whatever. I still think he has plus athleticism, a little bit over uh, overlooked uh, in the sense of his game. But yeah, I'm going with Kenny Pickett. Now they have that quarterback. Again, they do have two other guys there. And we'll see how that whole thing works out. And that's one thing in the back of my mind. Like, man, they do have Jameson Williams there. I mean, James, Jameson Williams. They do have Jameis Winston there. They also brought in Andy Dalton. So you kind of have, I feel like that's the insurance policy, but uh, still going with the long-term answer here, which is Kenny Pickett. If one of those top couple wide receivers are still there, would that have changed your mind? Or you think just the quarterback's a priority here, Croc? Uh, we're, we're not, we're not uh, showing our hand. Okay. <laughs> we're on the Tony, clock in a couple of picks. So Tony, what, what fair point, Tony, what, what are you hearing about the saints and their interest in a potential quarterback here? I think if they stand pat and they don't move up, I've always thought it's going to be quarterback receiver. Now people say, well, they need a tackle. Well, they need a left tackle. And really there's no left tackles available. You're not going to reach at this point point in time. So uh, that's the way I felt all along. I, and I agree with what Eric was saying. Yeah. They got two guys on the roster, but you know what? You got to start to get somebody in there for the future, because uh, I don't know that Winston or Dalton is the future answer for, for the saints outside of the 2022 season. All right, let's move on here. We have Kenny Pickett off the board to the Saints. Uh, I will very briefly recap what we've done so far here because we're literally halfway through the first round. Jaguars at number one, Iki Aquanu. Lions at number two, Aiden Hutchinson. Texans at number three, Derek Stingley. The Jets take Trayvon Walker. The New York Giants take Sauce Gardner. The Carolina Panthers select Charles Cross. The New York Giants take the last of those top three offensive tackles in Evan Neal. The Falcons gobble up Kayvon Thibodeau, who slid down the board just a wee bit. The Seahawks selected Trevor Penning at number nine. The Jets, after selecting Walker at four, get their top wideout Drake London at 10. The Washington Commanders select Garrett Wilson, uh, the wide receiver out of Ohio State. And number 12, the Vikings select Kyle Hamilton to help out their secondary. 
The Texans supplement their first pick, Derek Stingley, with an edge rusher in Jermaine Johnson. That'll make Lovey Smith very happy. The Ravens decide not to go Jordan Davis. Instead, they go Zion Johnson, the big guard out of Boston College. The Eagles select speed wide receiver Jamison Williams. Another year, another wide receiver for the Eagles in the first round. Then the Saints select Kenny Pickett. Tony, we're up to you, I believe. Yep, number 17, the L.A. Chargers. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, the Chargers are looking at the board, and they can't believe that Jordan Davis is still available. This is a guy that I wrote months uh, during Pro Day week, uh, Pro Day month. They like Jordan Davis. They were all over him. There was some, I, I believe, speculation that they could trade up to get him early in the process. They liked him so much. They didn't have to move, and Jordan Davis is staring him in the face. Player they wanted, fits a need, and far and away, as far as I'm concerned, Great value with the 17th pick. Yeah, the Eagles thought about picking Jordan Davis, too, by the way, when they selected Jamison Williams at 15. They hoped he would get there, but I think this is a high-value pick for the Chargers here at 17. Who are the other people that you think in this mix would be in the mix for the Chargers here? Tony, I know they need a right tackle, but really no one is here. That would be worth the price of admission. What are the positions would you think they'd be thinking about? Receiver. I think if Drake London is available, he would be consideration. I think, obviously, Chris Olave is still on the board. You know, a, a deep threat. I, I think if there's no good right tackle, which I don't expect there to be, if they can't get a Jordan Davis, I think they'll, they'll get the receiver. All right. The Eagles love pass rushers. Unfortunately, you know, George Karloftis would be a thought here for me. Um, if I'm the Philadelphia Eagles, they are a little old at that defensive line spot. But boy, guys, they need corners. Uh, they've needed corners for a while. And I do think right now, there's a fairly a guy that I think is better than the rest of the corners on the board. I'm going right now between Karloftis and the cornerback. I'm going to give the Eagles the cornerback. I'm going to give them Trent McDuffie, the cornerback out of Washington here. I think it'll be close between him and Karloftis, but I'll go McDuffie here and give the Eagles their cornerback uh, to go along with their pick of uh, Jameis Williams a little bit earlier in the round. It'll be interesting to see if McDuffie gets past the Vikings at uh, 12, because I, I know we have him taking Hamilton. McDuffie's a player that they like. Uh, as far as the Eagles are concerned, you know, the Eagles also like Devin Lloyd, and they need a three-down linebacker. And Devin he Lloyd's was a guy on my list, too. Yep, he was yeah, the third Devin guy. Devin Lloyd is still, still on the board. Uh, so that would also be a consideration. Yeah, pass rusher, you can get a pass rusher later on. Probably get a pass rusher in round two. Uh, but you're either, you're either going to take Devin Lloyd, or if McDuffie's on the board, he's excellent value here. All right, now we have uh, Mickey Loomis and his right-hand man, Eric Crocker, up at number 19 with the Saints. What do you got, Croc? Oh, yeah, you guys made this easy for us. Uh, we're taking Chris Olave, receiver yeah. at Ohio State. So we still get a speed guy. Uh, maybe not quite as fast as Jameson Williams, but definitely plenty of speed to be able to win over the top. We saw the best of that with uh, former quarterback Justin Fields and how he was consistently beating guys. I mean, and beating guys, when you have a guy that's 10 yards off, in coverage and you still run right by him it's like yeah you can fly he has terrific <laughs> body control uh plus route runner as well good hands i think the the saints they got the quarterback and the receiver so that is our fifth wide receiver by the way in the top nine uh fourth wide receiver pardon me in the top 19 picks here tony you're up at number 20 with the steelers second quarterback here what do you got yeah this is you guys are making it easy for me as well i mean it's got to be malik willis I, I i think at this point in time if Malik Willis is available to the Steelers and they go in a different direction, that would be the bigger story than Malik than the Steelers taking Malik Willis. It's been known literally since the Senior Bowl that they really like Willis. As I had written to him in the combine, the word was their their strategy was to sign it or before the combine, I should say, sign a veteran free uh, sign a veteran quarterback, which they did in Mr. Trubisky, and then draft Malik Willis. It's a great pairing. I mean, you got Mr. Trubisky for two years. Don't even know what you're going to get on Mr. Trubisky but you're not putting Malik Willis in a situation where he's got to start from week one. I think Steeler fans should be very happy if this happens. All right, then we go to the Patriots, and, and I agree, Tony. I, that is one of my favorite fits in the whole draft. I just think they have the organizational stability to actually develop Malik Willis properly, which a lot of other organizations wouldn't have. Um, all right, the Patriots at 21, Croc. Always a mystery what New England might do here. What do you think? Well, no mystery here, man. We're going with Devin Lloyd out of Utah, linebacker. Oh, yeah. Get that guy. I feel like, you know, he's another guy that fits the culture of what they're doing over there with the New England Patriots. I think the thing I was battling with the most here was that in your head, you hear everybody saying they need receiver, they need receiver. But they haven't done very well with drafting receivers, Never. even in the first round. So 
Uh, we're going linebacker here, a guy that can come in and make an immediate impact and kind of run that defense. Well, ironically, guys, just looking at my like big board here of our first, you know, 21 selections, 17 of my first 18 players ranked are off. So, so far this has gone, um, I'm not going to say it's chalk, but I think, you know, teams have made pretty sound decisions here. All right, let's get to the Packers at number 22. Tony, you're up with Green Bay. Yeah, I, I would have taken uh, Zion Johnson if he's here. He's not available. So I'm going to go with Kenyon Green. They need Ooh. some big bodies on the inside. They need some uh, you know, people who are going to push. They need some interior offensive linemen. We can get a receiver later on. There's no receiver that stands out. Uh, but they do want an interior offensive lineman. With Zion Johnson off the board earlier than expected, I'm going to take the next top interior offensive lineman and go with Kenyon Green. Croc, did you just hear uh, down the road in, in Dallas at the Cowboys war room, Jerry Jones and Steven Jones just like throw a chair across the room? They're, they're a little no? upset. They're a little upset. <laughs> and yeah, I definitely heard uh, some country accents from the <laughs> South yelling through my window just now. Yeah, Kenyon Green, man. I mean, terrific guy. He's one of my favorite prospects in this class. You know, when people say like, who are your guys? Kenyon Green, he's one of my guys. Again, I talked about it, man. I, I put on three different films. And he was playing three different positions and have that type of versatility and be as good at guard as he is, but still have the flexibility in a pinch to be able to play outside. I think it's a great value pick. And I mean, just in general, a good football player. Hey, Tony, I was going to ask you, I've heard some rumblings about a knee issue with green. Have you heard anything about that? I've not. Okay. I mean, maybe I have not heard anything about it. Got it. Not always, always like to double check that stuff. Never know what to trust and what not to. All right. We got back to back here, Tony. you also have the Cardinals at 23. What do you got? I think I may break the Cowboys' hearts again. I'm going to go with the pass rusher, George Karlaftis. I mean, a guy who could stand over tackle, come out of a three-point stance. Uh, they, they drafted David Collins last year, but they're using him an inside linebacker, which I thought he would have been a good pass rusher. But they get the guy who's more natural in George Karlaftis, and I think it's good value here. Yeah, the Cowboys needed a pass rusher. That would have been a guy, one of the two guys they considered. They're not happy. Uh, they come up here now at pick number 24. They would have picked Zion Johnson. They would have picked Kenyon Green. They would have picked any of those four wide receivers that are off the board if they were sitting there, but they're all gone. So do they go Jahan Dotson? I don't think they want to pick a guy that I know some teams see him as, as a full slot. I know he's done both. I don't think the Cowboys want the smaller wide out. So I'm going to go with the other interior offensive lineman. I'm going to go Tyler Linderbaum and they're going to try to repeat their success that they had with, uh, Travis Frederick, gosh, what was that? 2013, I think, nine or 10 drafts ago. I think personally that he's going to drop to the second round in this draft, but I think the way the Cowboys got wiped out here at pass rusher, at interior offensive line, at it wide receiver, I think this is the pick. That, and, and by the way, Devin Lloyd too could have been a choice for them here. I think that would have been a realistic option. With all those guys wiped out, I'm going to go Linderbaum. Think about the difference between Frederick and Linderbaum. It's probably about 40 pounds. Uh, I mean, I understand the reasoning behind it. Uh, I think Linderbaum may be a little bit too small for the Cowboys. But, you know, like you said, John Johnson's off the board. Kenyon Green's off the board. They got no pass rusher. I mean, can they trade down? Maybe they look safety, but. Oh, Tony, I'm with you. If this is the situation, they are looking <clears throat> to move down like there's no tomorrow. No question. If they can, you know, you got to right. have somebody who wants to move up into that spot. So. I mean, I understand the pick, and now we're getting the point, as far as my board's concerned, all the first-rounders, all the true first-rounders are off, and now you're looking at guys who are late first-rounders, early second-rounders, Linderbaum being one of them. Yep, same here. Me too. All my true ones are, are off the board. I'm with you. Croc, you are up now with the Buffalo Bills. Oh, you know, you're sitting pretty. You got receivers. You got quarterbacks. You're one play away from going to the Super Bowl. You're feeling great. What are you thinking here? Yeah, and we're feeling great. And I wanted to go cornerback in this position here, but, man, you just got to help Josh Allen. We're going running back Brees Hall. Ooh. A lot of people are liking Brees Hall to the Buffalo Bills. They solidify that backfield and have a guy that can really be a three-down back and do it all. I mean, again, there, there was one game I was watching earlier in the season or later in the season, and nobody carried the ball outside of Josh Allen for an entire half. And how many times this season was he the leading rusher in the game? And how sustainable is that for a guy? I mean, I get it. Josh Allen, he's a big guy. He can take that pounding. But at some point, you got to give him a little bit of help. And I think Brees Hall, a guy who has the size, has the ability, again, three down back, good pass protector. He does all these things. a very well-rounded game. You don't want to go running back here. You would like to go Kyrie Elam and go cornerback yeah. or maybe another cornerback. But 
got to help your guy, Josh Allen. So, Brees Hall. If you went corner, Croc, who would be your top corner? Elam, Gordon, or Booth? I'm an I'm a, I'm a Elam guy. I, but I might be a little bit higher on him than the scouts. We'll, we'll see. But I feel like he's almost a clone of what we got from C.J. Henderson. And not just because, you know, they're coming from the same school, but just the way they look, the way they move, the way they test. I mean, the size, it's, a lot of it is identical. I think his game is really good. But uh, it doesn't quite seem to be as high in the uh, circles of the NFL right now. That's a, if you want a guy to beat up receivers at the line of scrimmage, Kyer Elam's your guy. He will knock the you-know-what out of him. He's a little grabby down the field, but I agree with you. I think his, his, his press man ability is really strong. All right, let's go. Who do we got up next year? Tennessee Titans, Tony, number 26. Could look cornerback, could look at different directions. I'm going to go with something that I heard about a month ago, and it makes a lot of sense. I'm taking Tyler Smith, the offensive lineman, out of Tulsa. Here's why. The Titans need an interior offensive lineman. They could also need a, a right tackle. Tyler Smith can play both positions. What I'm told is a lot of people who people who want to develop Tyler Smith at tackle will first start him off at guard. So, you know, you've got that right side of Dylan Redon, Dylan Redunds and Tyler Smith. You may be able to switch him because Dylan Redunds' best position could be actually offensive guard, and you move Tyler Smith out to right tackle. Now, mm-hmm. Smith has got tremendous upside, and he's established himself around the league as the fifth best tackle in this draft. There may be some bumps early in the road, but he's big, he's physical, he's smart. I mean, he's an articulate, intelligent guy. He's got tremendous amount of upside. He's incredibly athletic. It's just a matter of developing him, and, and I think the Titans will have, a tr- will have a tremendous offensive lineman on their hands. All right, Tony, we're getting up here at 27 with the Bucks. I'm going to ask my, my, my area scout here that, that's covered the player. I've heard some rumors, Tony, that Devontae Wyatt might have some off-the-field issues that teams are, are worried about, some red flags there. What are you hearing about Devontae Wyatt off the field? Yeah, nothing, I, nothing major. I mean, listen, all, the, all these kids have off-the-field issues, but there's nothing. I mean, and Georgia players, as we've seen with Adam Anderson, you know, sometimes have more because they're more under the microscope. I have not heard anything as far as major off-the-field issues or injuries about any of the guys who are who, players who are going to go, go in the first round. It's not, I haven't heard anything to say similar to say Aziz Ajilari last year who dropped because of major injuries. I have, you know, what are their character issues? Well, you talk about Kayvon Thibodeau. I've not heard anything really bad about uh, Devontae Wyatt or really anybody in the, uh, that's expected to go in the first round. All right, I'm looking at my board here. I would have loved if either Zion or Kenyon Green dropped. I would have even considered a Linderbaum here uh, for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, corner is another spot I would consider, but, you know, they're aging up front. They're going to have to replace some of these guys coming up here. So I'm going to go Devontae Wyatt, who I personally, this is just me personally, I actually think he's going to be a more productive pro than, than Jordan Davis. I like him a lot. And I think the Bucs always want to have pass rush up front. So I'm going to go Devontae Wyatt, defensive tackle out of Georgia to the Bucs at 27. And again, one of these one, two guys, right? One of these borderline late first, early second guys. Uh, and good pick. You got to remember, they got a defensive minded head coach up there, uh, there right now in Tampa. So he's going to love the pick. I think it's going to be uh, Devontae White. The other guy I'm hearing that they like a lot is Daxton Hill of Michigan. Mm. Mm, yeah, but yeah, he, he's a good player too. He can do a little bit of everything. All right, Tony, after you selected Kenyon Green at 22, uh, a large pack of cheese heads have gathered outside your team offices with a lot of signs with, with, with the letters WR on them. Yeah. And, 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 and they're angry. They're upset. They're anxious. And I think I might see Aaron Rodgers in the group. I'm not positive. He has the man bun going. I think it's him. So with that, with that in mind, what are you doing for the Packers at 28? Any, any uh, torches and pitchforks in, in that group? A there? little bit. Yeah. Uh-huh. There you go. I'll tell you what I hear about this. Pick. They're I, actually I'm throwing t- cheese at your offices. All there you go. Just as, long, just as long as it's yellow American cheese. Yeah. Or, or <laughs> alone, that I'm fine with that. Um, two things. I'm hearing that the Packers may actually trade out. And Seattle may trade back into the first round at this spot to take a quarterback. That quarterback being Desmond Ritter. But for the purposes of this draft, I'm going to make the Packer fans happy. And I'm going to probably make Eric Crocker happy when I select Traylon Burks. I'm told that's the player that they really like a lot. They could take them early. They could take uh, Traylon Burks with that 22nd pick uh, where I haven't taken Kenyon Green. Uh, he's a big body receiver. You know, Eric's talked about him a lot. He's a, he's a fringe late first, early second. The need's there. He catches the ball exceptionally well. 
you know, Aaron Rodgers, if he's not happy, at least he's a little bit relieved after this selection. All right, Traylon Burks, the running catch guy. They like big body wide receivers. Makes a lot of sense. Now we got Crocker. He makes three out of the last four picks here. You got two times with the Kansas City Chiefs, Croc. Yeah, well, the first time with the Kansas City Chiefs, they're going Daxton Hill, safety slash corner slash nickel out of Michigan and losing a guy like Tyron Matthew with his versatility and the things he was able to do on the back end, you know, and with Tyron Matthew is more than just the coverage ability, right? It's the leadership, it's the smarts, it's him manning that secondary and being the quarterback back there, but losing him and plugging in a guy like Daxon Hill, I like that. And then at 30, we'll go with the Chiefs. And this was a tough one because I wanted to go corner, but I'm like, don't go corner. I want to go edge rusher. And I'm like, okay, I don't know. Do you take David Ajabo here? Obviously, he's had an injury and there's a need there. But they're going to go receiver, and they're going to go with Dotson out of Penn State. Was it close for you, Dotson and either Pickens, Watson, or Sky Moore, or was it clear? Uh, Dotson, to me, I mean, just his explosive ability to start-stop, the ability to play inside and outside. I think it fits a lot of – not – again, you don't try to get Tyreek Hill. I think that's almost impossible. You have to get lucky to do that. But to have a guy that has that type of ability, I think Dotson is the closest to that. All right. Very good. So you got Dax Hill, who, again, is a really good Teron Matthew replacement. Good pick, I think, Croc. Then Dotson, number 30 to the Chiefs. I'm up for the Bengals here at 31. And, boy, Arnold Ebicady is a sore thumb on my board right now. Uh, I think he's probably the best player I have left here. But, boy, do the Bengals really want to go to war with Eli Apple as their starting cornerback in week one this season? I think that they decide to go need here, even though he might not be the highest-rated player. And I I have Elam, Gordon, and Booth in kind of a cluster. I don't think they want to roll the roll the dice on Booth because of the injury. Uh, I th- I'm going to go Kyler Gordon here, cornerback out of Washington. He can play man. He can play zone. I know he didn't test as well as other people thought, but again, you watch him on tape. He's a good player, man. When you ask him to play man, he can do it. I'm going to go Kyler Gordon, cornerback out of Washington to the Bengals. That makes sense. I mean, Gordon could actually go to Kansas City uh, with one of those two picks because they like him a lot. But, yeah, I, I mean, Gordon is a guy that gets a variety of opinions. There are a lot of scouts that feel he's, you know, bottom third of round one player. There are other scouts that think he's a midday two selection. But you're filling a knee with a potentially very good corner. And, again, I would have thought about interior offensive line there, too, if one of those top three guys were there. They are not. So, no. And let's go here. Croc, you picked uh, the lines at number two, Aiden Hutchinson. Now you're up again at number 32. What are you thinking here? A little 50-year option on a QB, or are you looking for a position player? Uh, I'm, I'm looking for a position player. But, again, I, I, I like your thinking with the 50-year option for quarterback, and they do have another pick coming up. I'm actually going to go back with my initial thought. And, yeah, they're going to go quarterback. They're going to go Matt Corral here. I was thinking George Pickens, but I think he'll be there in a couple picks when they pick a little bit later. They definitely need receiver. But, yeah, let's go with quarterback Matt Corral for the the Lions. Hopefully the fans don't uh, try to kill me for that one because they've they've been a little upset with taking quarterback. They think, like, no, got Jared Goff. He's the guy. I, I don't think so, and I don't even think the Lions think so. What do you think about Corral going ahead of Ritter, Tony? And I know a lot of people have Corral graded ahead of Ritter, but the 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 waves from the NFL seem to be that that Ritter is almost like a sure thing first round pick now because of how he wowed people in meetings. I I would take Corral over Ritter. There's no doubt about it. Matt Corral is my number two rated quarterback. Now there may be some bumps in the road, but there's going to be bumps in the road with Ritter as well. I mean, I've stated all along, and it came out yesterday. Uh, publicly for the first time by scouts, you know, Ritter's accuracy concerns me. And I'm not talking about statistical accuracy. I'm talking about pass placement, not having receivers adjust backwards to get rev the throw or, or get vertical. I think the corral's a little bit more uh, accurate with, he's much better with his pass placement, but Ritter's got the size. Ritter's got that, uh, you, you know, that pocket uh, presence, that pro- pocket stature. He can make plays with his legs or his feet. You talked about the interviews. He's won a lot in the college level. He's won a lot in a big time college level. It wouldn't, I wouldn't be against it. I wouldn't think it, it, it's an awful thing, but I would be surprised by, for exactly the reasons you mentioned, Ritter getting first round grades across the board in the league. All you right, talk now- about the accuracy issues too. I mean, <laughs> when, when you just watch him on film and I was watching the Alec Pierce and doing some last second studying on him and the misses are bad misses. Yeah. It's not just 
oh, you know, miss a throw here and there, or, oh, okay, it's a little bit behind the guy, or, okay, a guy had to slow up for it. It's seven yards out of bounds. And it's like, wow, how do you miss that bad <laughs> from one play to another? You can make a tight window throw, and that looks good. And then all of a sudden, I mean, you just you just sail a pass, and that happened multiple times per game. So if you can get that under control, then, yeah, obviously, you know, you'll, you'll be fine with it. But is that just who he is? And I think that's a big question that you have to ask yourself. It absolutely is. And there were some bounce passes during his pro day. You people were, were gushing on his pro day. If you watched it, there were some bounce passes. You know, they say it's coachable and they can coach it out of him and get him to become more pass placement. I kind of take that with sort of a jaded eye. You know, t- we've seen time and time again, uh, you know, they try and coach the quarterback to be accurate. And it's a very difficult thing. All right, guys, let's, we got a few minutes here before we got to wrap. So let, let's do a couple of different exercises here. One, each of you give me, what do you think the most meaningful pick is early in this draft that's going to determine kind of how this draft goes one through 32 on Thursday night? Tony, why don't you go first? It's got to be the first one. I mean, if they take Quanu, you know, you, the Texans and the Jets have to reassess what they're going to do. If they take Trayvon Walker, then, you know, what, either the Texans or the Jets are going to be very happy because Aquano is going to be there when they're called to the board. So really right off the bat, it, it, the first pick sets the tone and will have reverberating effects really through the top five. How about you, Crocker? What pick are you keeping an eye on? I, I think the pick of Stingley, like the prospect, you know, where does he go? Because we have him going number three overall right now. He's a guy that can go as low as maybe pick – uh, 12 to the Vikings, maybe 13 to the Texans there. Uh, there are a lot of teams in between that can definitely use his services and really like him. Talked about the Giants wanting either him or Sauce Gardner, the New York Jets, where they're going to do. So I think just where does Stingley go? That's the one thing I'm going to be very intrigued to see. Yeah, and I think the Texans are really interesting, right? Because they have two picks in the top 13. So who do they pick with that first selection? Because that'll dictate what they do with 13 then. You know, right. do they go offensive line like a guy like Aquanu? Do they go pass rusher? Do they go cornerback? I think it's just so wide open what they might do um, that, you know, that could really determine what happens in a four, five, six, and seven. Uh, most team likely to pull off a trade on Thursday night. Who do you guys got? I think we all agree, Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seattle could make a couple of trades. Uh, I mean, trade down from nine and then trade back into the bottom part of round one. So uh, I think Seattle, they need to, they need extra selections, uh, obviously, uh, because they're in the rebuilding mode. I think Carolina would really like to trade. I don't know that, that they're going to be able to do it, though. Yeah, I think Carolina wants to trade more than any other team. I'm with you, Tony. Not sure they can. I'm going to say the Eagles just because. Howie Roseman's not making a trade. Howie Roseman ain't happy. Like, Howie Roseman just loves to deal up, down, whatever. So I- I'm going to go Philly, team most likely to make a trade there. Never, right. mind the fact, never mind the fact he's got a ton of picks, not only this year as well as next year. The other team to keep an eye on is the Kansas City Chiefs. I mean, the Kansas City Chiefs got two first-round picks. They've got a ton of picks in day two. So I- I've not heard that they're, you know, they're actively shopping those picks, but – if they feel Jamison Williams is their guy, I could see them packaging a bunch of picks and then moving up to grab them the way they moved up to get Patrick Mahomes a couple of years ago. Do you think the Jets and Ravens might try to consolidate at some point too? The Ravens, I think, have what, six picks in rounds three and four. The Jets have four picks in the top. What is it, 35, 36, whatever it is, 37, 38. Do you think those two teams, guys, might look at some point to, to consolidate their picks and, and try to make some type of move? Croc, what do you think? My bad, I didn't hear the, what was the question? <laughs> Jets and Ravens, they have so many extra picks. Do you think they might try to consolidate their picks a little bit to try to either move up or even maybe move back at some point? I mean, obviously, we talked about the New York Jets potentially trading for Debo Samuel. But aside from that, I mean, how many picks is too much? Too many picks, right? Right. They've had multiple first-round picks in a couple of drives now. When, you know, they just took Vera Tucker and they had another first-round pick in that class as well. So at some point, you have to get really good football players. And they have no superstars on their roster right now. They have no guys that can help sell tickets. So who can you get on your team that can help at least drive that selling point to your fan base? And I don't know if collecting more draft capital is the way to go about that. Yeah, I mean, it's a different situation because the Ravens are right there. And the Ravens just need a few players to push them over over the hump. I completely agree with what Eric says, but the Jets have holes everywhere. And <laughs> you feel those holes are free, you know, despite the fact they've had all these draft picks through the years, and they've had all this money, they still have holes all over the place. 
So I, 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 what Eric said makes sense, but the danger is, you know, if you trade all this draft capital for a guy like Debo Samuel, great, you got Debo Samuel, but you still need a corner. You still haven't solved the pass rush, depending on who they take it for. You know, you, you still have all these other holes. I, I think it would be easier for the Ravens to say, package a few selections to move up to get that one guy. And it makes more sense compared to say the jets. All right, guys. Um, who is the sore thumb left on your board that has not been drafted? Ooh. My, well, I'll go first. Okay. I got two. I have Arnold Abiketti at a Penn state. I think he's probably going to figure out a way to get into that first round. He didn't. Um, him and Sky Moore are the two guys that I have graded highest that are still left. I think Sky Moore is going to be a really good player. I think some teams might see him as just a slot, which is why he might slide into round two here, and he probably will slide into round two. I happen to like him more than other people do. And again, I think Ebikati is is the next best pass rusher. You, some of you guys might like Boye Mafe better, but uh, I would be. I, I think those are the two guys, and then the two corners, right, Elam and Booth. And then Jalen Petrie even is another guy that I think the safety is a good player that's sitting there. Those are some of the guys that kind of jump out to me. How about you guys? Well, I, I got a Jabu, but obviously there's, there's, there's circumstances that as to why he's still on the board. I mean, after that, I got Matt Corral, Nicobe Dean, Louis Seen, and Kerry Elam. Yeah. Uh, Louis Seen is the guy for me. I mean, I'm just really high on him and his ability and I feel like there should be about four safeties that go in the first round this year, and we might only see two go off the board. We did in this mock where we had Daxton Hill and we had uh, uh, Kyle Hamilton, but there are a few other guys, like you guys mentioned, Petrie, uh, for sure. You have uh, Seen. I feel like we have four guys should go first round, but yeah, he's the Seen is the guy who I, I would like to have in the first round if I'm a team picking at the back end. Dallas and Cowboys he- may be potentially like him too. Yeah, I've heard that they do like him. Any other guys that you think that we did not select in the first round that are likely first round picks when the actual draft happens on Thursday? I mean, all my uh, guys that I have uh, surefire first round grades are off the ball, off the board. So no, not really. You're looking at. I think Boye Mafe could end up with Kansas City with, with, with one of those two picks. Uh, you know, Desmond Ritter. Is talked about, but how is he going to end up in the first round? Probably from a team trading back into the first round. And, and that's that's really it, no. How about N'Kobe Dean? Do you guys think just all the <clears throat> after-season stuff has, 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 has kind of sunk him a little bit? Do you guys think he is a shot to sneak into round one, or do you think he's a solid mid-round two guy? Well, what I was told about with, with Dean is this, is he's get, it's 50-50 whether he's going to be a first-round pick. And the reason is, is, the, the fact that he's he's not really big, he's not tall, he's more of a run and chase run guy, good up the field on the blitz, but he's gonna get, get, going to get overmatched in coverage by the bigger tight ends is going to what's push him out of the first round. Somebody said he's a Zach Thomas type and that he's a more of a two down linebacker where it's third and eight. You know, are you going to leave him on the field and play him as a safety? You can't put him over the tight end because the tight ends are going to have a, you know, four, five, six inch advantage on him. Interesting. All right, guys, final thoughts. This is our last pod before we get the first round in the books. Just tell me what you're thinking, excitement level, however you want to take this, take it any direction you want. Croc, why don't you go first? I mean, definitely excited, right? I mean, we've been preparing for this and and pounding all these different names into our heads and, and giving our evaluations of the guy. And I think right now in a class where a lot of people are saying isn't very top heavy they, or just a weak draft in general, you're kind of hearing that thrown around. I'm just curious to see which guys go where. And I feel like from everything that we're hearing, scouts are all over the place on a lot of these different guys. So, you know, we mentioned about six guys that could potentially go in the first round. I'm just curious to see who ends up falling out. I think two things. Number one, it's very quiet. (laughs) I'm just waiting, you know, for the bomb to burst. It it, it just seems very quiet, uh, you know, the past uh, couple of days, except for Cam Robinson um, uh, being signed to the extension. I think it's going to be a very long first round because, you know, you don't know what's going to happen top. You know, last year you had your top, your top four teams knowing what was going to happen. So, you know, the cards were coming in uh, rel- relatively quickly. I think you're going to see a lot of teams use all that time on the clock because there's so much indecision and because, you know, there are no surefire. I mean, you usually go through the mock and you can pick up five or six teams. You know, this guy's going there. You, you know, this guy's going there. What do we have? One or two teams this year. So I, I think it's going to be a very long first round. 
All right, so I'll give you guys this before we leave. I, I checked Twitter really fast to make sure no news broke while we were doing this. Laramie Tunsil, listen to this. Oh, boy. A little tweet thread. No, it's really funny. For the past six years, I've been asked about this moment, the gas mask. I spent six years trying to do rather than say on the field and off the field. Fall 2021, I spoke to Complex for the first time about this moment and today, the day before draft day, I'm officially moving on and putting this moment in the past. I'm minting a one-of-one one NFT of the infamous gas mask video wow. to be listed. A portion of the proceeds will benefit Last Prisoner PRJ, which supports these incarcerated for cannabis offenses. I'm looking forward and excited for the future, and I'm grateful for all those that supported me on my draft night and those that have, will continue to support my football journey. That's tremendous. That's great. It's yeah, great. it is. I mean, good for him that he can look back and, and you know, kind of laugh at it and uh, I guess, uh, I guess help his cause. Uh, Cause that, that video cost him a lot of money, a lot of money. And if you know that whole story of what happened there, it, it, it's really sad because it was done vindictively uh, uh, against Hunzel. So good for him. Good for him. <laughs> what do you think, Rock? You know, got it. Got to capitalize on whatever you can <laughs> nowadays. So uh, I like it. And the fact that some of the proceeds are going to something that he feels good in. And me having some family members in the like legitimate cannabis business, uh, you know, it is something that has like this negative conversation to it, but no, it's, 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 it's a good thing. So I like it. Uh, if you can figure out how to do it legally. It's an NFT world. We're all just living in it, boys. And I, Ted, Ted by the way, I, I would love to know the Vegas odds of Kayvon Thibodeau releasing some type of NFT of him like hugging Goodell, like right after he gets drafted on draft night. The, I think, got to imagine there are some odds on Vegas of that. It'll be fun. Yeah. Gentlemen, enjoy the draft Thursday night. Guys, we'll be back on Friday morning to record a reaction to round one. We'll get that up ASAP. Thanks, guys. Thanks. For Tony Pauling and Eric Crocker, I'm John Schmelk. Thanks for being with us as we've done our draft journey here on draft season. We'll have a few more episodes, again, reacting to round one of the draft, then reacting to the full draft. That'll air on Sunday. Then we'll have one more draft next week, wrapping everything up. And then we'll even start talking about 2023 prospects. Yes, we're that sick. For Tony, for Eric, I'm Schmelk. We'll see you then.